and I'm a third year or sinus student and, um, in the Bonner Leaders and Melrose Fellows programs. I would like to take some time to make some brief announcements and introduce our guests before we begin. But first, I want to thank you, our attendees and our sinus community members, so much for coming out tonight to talk about this important and complex issue that will have historic consequences for our future as a democratic commonwealth and country. The last time the state was redistricted using census data in 2011, this very area of Pennsylvania was so highly gerrymandered that it was used as an example of gerrymandering nationwide, highlighting a perfect example of democratic politics gone wrong. While a lot has changed in 10 years, we still have a lot of work to do to end the, part the problem of partisan gerrymandering in PA. With that said, I would like to welcome Rich Rafferty, the Montgomery County Lead for Fair Districts PA, which is a single mission statewide project of the League of Women Voters PA. Rich joined FDPA in April 2017 and became the local lead in 2019. A native Philadelphian and longtime resident of White Marsh Township, Rich is a recent retired IT director uh, for a, fair, a nearby international corporation. Next, I would like to welcome Justin Folaire. Justin is the project director of Draw the Lines PA, which is an initiative from the nonpartisan nonprofit Committee of 70. Valaire has helped lead Draw the Lines since its launch in 2017. Before Draw the Lines, he served as the director of Bike and Build, a Philadelphia based nonprofit engaging young adults in volunteer service through long distance cycling events. He is a native, Colorado, a native of Colorado and even once in a while sometimes thinks about pretending to be a long distance runner. I didn't write that though. <laughs> Um, before I invite the speakers to begin, I'd like to recognize and thank the local leaders, um, Mayor Wright Riggins and State Representative Webster, as well as uh, State uh, Katie Moose staff, who um, are either attending this event or watching the live stream. Um, and uh, I would like to thank him for showing a commitment to fair and transparent redistricting process, uh, practices. Um, I would like to also share with you all that this is a live streams event. So if you um, ask a question during the Q&A, your voice will be recorded and be posted on the live on main page of the Erosinus website and also on the Erosinus YouTube. Last but not least, please remember to wear your masks at all times during the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you to the Erosinus community for inviting Fair Districts of Pennsylvania to this event tonight. I'm hoping you find it educational. I think you'll find it informative, if nothing else. And if, if I could stress, most importantly, the urgency of this issue. When we talk about redistricting, which is, which is really one thing, that's the drawing of these maps. And I invite you at some time tonight to please come up and take a look at these maps. I don't go anywhere without them. We've been doing fair districts. We're a statewide uh, all-volunteer organization, and we've been as Olivia mentioned, we're a single mission project of the League of Women Voters PA, and that's to end gerrymandering. Our primary method, which started in 2015, was to reform the redistricting process. We were not successful because our approach to reforming the redistricting process in Pennsylvania runs with the legislature. The legislature controls the process, and I'll explain that in a few minutes, how things work. But our ability to reform the players and the process did not work. All we asked the legislator in Harrisburg was to give up power. Is that so? <laughs> Show of hands? Damn hard. All right? Damn hard, and it didn't happen. So where we are now, we are in the last inning, if you will, in the last few months of the redistricting process. All these maps that you see, they're congressional. How many folks, how many uh, congressional reps do we have? in Washington from Pennsylvania. Anybody? What's the number? How many? Let's try it again. It's a number between 17 and 19. <laughs> so today we have 18. And don't feel bad if you don't know, because when I joined, I knew nothing about this process. Because this process only occurs once every 10 years, driven by the census. census. That's right. It's a mysterious process. It is a classic closed door politicos only process. 
So it is largely invisible and out of the mainstream thinking. For all of us in Pennsylvania, and that's, some people like that. Once you learn more about it, most folks don't. But the idea is right now, we're in it right now, up to our, up to our waist and the water's rising. Our congressional maps will be, these maps will be tossed out, new maps will be drawn. Our 203 state reps who go to Harrisburg, Rep Webster is one of those, he's your local rep here. His district will be redrawn in some form or fashion. And then lastly, we have 50 state senators. Katie Muth is your state senator, and Katie's district as well may and will likely get redrawn. So we want to learn a little bit more about who draws them, what are the rules they operate on, and how can you participate? And if there's anything else we can do tonight, we'll be asking you to engage. Nothing changes in government unless there's citizen engagement. I knew that. I learned that. I knew nothing about citizen engagement. I was working full time, retired a little bit, then retired full time, and got engaged with this. And I certainly know uh, this is just one of many, many missions out uh, either in Harrisburg or Washington where people, regular citizens, have to force themselves to talk directly to your elected representatives. Nothing really changes without your direct engagement. So as you're all, I presume, voting age or very close to it, this is your problem. This, whatever goes down with these maps for Congress, the people we send to Washington, or the 203 state reps or the 50 state senators that go to Harrisburg, is going to be your problem as well as the rest of us for the next 10 years, unless we try to make something good happen right now. We are in the last days of making this happen. Fair Districts is focused exclusively on this process, as I said, single mission. So we take a look at our problem in Pennsylvania is that by any definition, the maps, when you look at the maps for Congress, state rep, state senate, they were gerrymandered, which is a very simple definition, the drawing of district boundaries, electoral district boundaries, to favor one party. It really is not that complicated. It is a closed door process run typically by the majority party leadership in Harrisburg. This is a Harrisburg issue. This is not a Washington issue. Harrisburg, our state capitals. The reality is most state capitals and what goes on doesn't get a whole lot of media attention. It doesn't get a whole lot of social media pop of any kind. So they benefit, particularly leadership in Harrisburg benefits by working, I don't want to say in darkness, but out of the spotlight. So it's a wonderful thing. And now they've had, they have constitutional control to redraw these maps. And we'll talk about specifically which maps and who does it in a minute. But it's amazing the amount of power given to a few individuals for essentially a closed door process. It's not that far from the idea from, let's say, a student example of you guys deciding which questions are going to be on the test. It really is that inherent of a conflict of interest, that the politicians, particularly leadership, is drawing their political districts. And typically the majority party will draw those new districts that run for 10 years to favor the re-election of their party, the incumbents particularly, but certainly to protect the incumbents and to reassure for the next four to five election cycles the re-election of their party to stay in power. Amazing, it's how it works. And let's take a look a little bit more, specifically in Pennsylvania, okay? This is what we've told people, I've been out of this stuff for four years now. The reality is, legislators choose our voters. Now, is that a blanket statement? Does it happen across every district and every corner of Pennsylvania? No, but where opportunity arises, it's hard to resist temptation, to make sure you protect. And let's make sure that our people, our party gets reelected, since we're driving the bus and drawing these lines again. Our problem is in Pennsylvania, our perspective serving from fair districts and legal women voters of Pennsylvania, is that the result of gerrymandering, safe districts, I'm the elected representative in a safe district. Geez, my district just got drawn based on recent registration or election results, kind of 60-40 for my guys, my party. I'm going to feel pretty good about that. Do I have to work as hard as a representative when I don't know? and don't care who my competition might be because I'm pretty sure I'm going to get reelected if I choose to run again in two years or four years again and again because I'm in a protected district. Representative Webster is a little bit of a different situation because it's more competitive. It just is. So he's and in Montgomery County, which is where the non-focus has been, 
we've seen we have many, many purple districts where there is real competition that can happen. Not so much down in the lower parts of Montgomery County toward the Philadelphia line here, but when you start getting into the central part of Montgomery County where we are tonight, and certainly up in the northern and northwestern parts of Montgomery County, very competitive in all cases. So Montgomery County becomes a focus, a focus for where can we find electoral advantage based on how we draw the lines. That's the world we live in today in Montgomery County. It's not true everywhere I grew up. I was raised in Philadelphia. When I, when I lived in Philadelphia, it was nine to one, D's to R's. That's come all the way down to seven to one. All right, so if you're on the D team in Philadelphia, you have a reasonable chance of winning without a whole lot of competition. There are a few areas in Philadelphia, but the reality is, can you redraw districts to ensure competitiveness or choice for voters in all cases? Not really. Uh, it depends a bit on the nature of the people who live there, their voting preferences, and their party registration typically. But the reality is where we are in Montgomery County, surrounding Chester County and Bucks County, very, very competitive areas. And that's what we try to keep an eye on. But when we don't have, when we have safe districts, it's no competition, and our biggest problem is there's no incentive to compromise. One party drives the bus, the other party is left out in the hallway. Not cool, doesn't work for often half of the population or more of a particular state in Pennsylvania. Many, many times it's certainly the case. And there's no incentive to work, even across the branches of government. And both parties do it. I'm not interested here in trash the Republicans in Pennsylvania. I'm not going to do that. He goes, if you go down to Maryland, anyone here from Maryland? Um, my God, the first time I saw the maps they drew in Maryland, it blew me away. And that's the Democrats in charge down in Maryland. And they've been in charge for decades. They're doing the same thing. It's human nature. That's our problem. That's our challenge. It's human nature when no one is looking. There's no accountability. Let me draw these maps to make sure, A, I get reelected, and B, all my friends do as well for the next 10 years. That's the game. And let's take a look a little closer at how it's played here, all right? In Pennsylvania, all right, there's two, lot, there's two lanes here, okay? On the left side is the state districts, 253, 50 state senators, 203 state reps. Rep. Webster, is that enough, 203? Do we need more? <laughs> is there room in that chamber for another 50 or 60? I, I can't explain why we have to have a senate. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, it's an amazingly large number. Our population of Pennsylvania, uh, not really growing, we're kind of plateaued now for the last two census, around 13 million or so, but we still have 203. So all of these maps for the state seats in Harrisburg are driven by our Pennsylvania Constitution, of which I knew nothing about before I signed up. And there's not a whole lot of language here, except in Article 2, Section 16. All districts for the same level of office, a state rep or state senator, must have reasonably equivalent populations. Districts must be geographically, there's our phrase, compact and contiguous. When anyone looks at that, so I'm no different than anyone else, the first thing I do is go, hmm, shapes look a little different. What's, what's going on there? It gets people's attention. And the other thing that people do, because I've been using these maps for four years, for all kinds of events, community events, whatever it may be, the first thing most people do is walk up and do what? They point to where they live. And, and they ask the question, geez, what's going on there? Now, I will tell you, and it's not a bad thing. It's very, very natural. Most people don't know who their state rep or state senator is. They just don't. Again, a lot of it has to do with media coverage. Brett Webster does a very good job of sending out communications and letting people know. But it is an education process. Because from a media standpoint, Harrisburg does not get a lot of recurring, recurring, what's happening, who are the players, what's going on. It only usually happens when something scandalous or something negative is going on. But that's really most folks don't really pay a whole lot of attention to what's going on in the government until something bad or something they don't like happens. But in Pennsylvania, this is the guidelines, not a whole lot. To draw our congressional maps to people we sent to Washington, it's a straight up legislative process. The legislature, the Pennsylvania House, the Pennsylvania Senate gets together, they draw the maps. Now who will do that? We'll show you in a minute. But it then has to go to the governor. 
et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that the state legislature drives the legislative process. There is no constitutional bounds. There is the Voting Rights, the Federal Voting Rights Act, which serves as a guardrail of sorts, though it's been weakened, to keep an eye on the congressional districts as well. But the congressional districts is all about the straight le legislative process. In 2018, most of you might have been here or in high school or so, these maps went under litigation, serious litigation, leaving the voters, ACLU, and the number of voters. To get to this example here in Montgomery County, but this was not the map for our 18 congressional seats that was drawn in 2011, 10 years ago. This map was redrawn in 2018 under the direction of the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, who hired their own mapper to redraw the 18 congressional districts for Pennsylvania. This is not what fair districts or most groups want. We don't want courts drawing maps. This is not a cool thing. But if you take some time tonight and come back, this was an example just down in our area here, Montgomery, Southeast Pennsylvania, uh, in 2011 when the federal, I'm sorry, when the congressional maps came down from the legislative process on the right hand side. Pennsylvania zoomed to the top. We were, I think we finished top three in most gerrymandered congressional states. It was bad news and lots of people went nuts, a lot of litigation. Nothing about the process was good. I lived in an area, I was three blocks away, I'm down in White Marsh Township, where my district was carved, my township was carved in two different districts. Um, one of those districts, separation was one street. About four blocks from where I live, there's one street separating. I won't go into the whys or wherefores, or you can draw your own conclusions of that, but we took a lot of legislative, whatever that legislative process was, was, was tossed out, and we wound up courts drawing maps. We do not want that process to happen. We want the legislator, legislature, we want this process to work for all of us in some form or fashion. But that's the basic rules of how do we do that. Let's take a look at who does it. Remember I told you before, it's a small circle. This is a, it's a myth bag, we'll say. Our state legislatures, and the reason I have this young lady up here with a magnifying glass, is that's because this is where fair districts is focusing. We are focusing on the redrawing of our 253 state legislative electoral districts. Not a whole lot of folks do that. Lots of folks will be on this side, the congressional districts, all right? But let's take a look at one at a time here. The LRC, the Legislative Reapportioning Committee, controls, it's a five-person committee who will control the drawing of our 253 districts. Who are the players? You can see it's leadership. Senate majority lead, Senate minority, House majority, House minority. They're the four elected uh, representatives or senators who then are elected by their caucuses for a leadership role in Harrisburg. The fifth person is Mark Nordenberg, who is the chair and often the deciding vote as the LRC goes down. Mark Nordenberg is a former uh, dean of, I think it's University of Pittsburgh Law School. I think that's his background. So he's a, he's a long-time lawyer and a, uh, a long-time academic as well. And he's been put in the hot seat. The problem is, again, he was, by definition, by the Pennsylvania Constitution, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court appointed Mark Nordenberg as the chair of this all important committee. And they've been busy. They've been working since May or June, uh, to focus on the maps here. And these are their guidelines. Not a whole lot there, but that's their guidelines to focus on. For the, our, what will be our 17 congressional maps for next year, it's different because it's a, it's a like I said, a legislative play. And right now the, the R's have the majority. And the leadership on the R side will draw, I, will, will, will drive it. We have the uh, House, State Government Committee, and the Senate State Government Committee. Representative Webster is a member, still right now, of the House State Government Committee. To date, our take from fair districts, uh, have, these have been um, somewhat parts. They are a political process, as we are told over and over again. But this is where we're at right now. This one, we believe, uh, there has been public hearings. Both groups have been doing some public hearings. But this is how things work. 
All right, so it's a small circle of leaders who are driving this process here right now. Most folks are left out of the process here. So far, so good. And I want to instill in Ken, I know that Justin will do the same. We're talking about a sense of urgency. We have the maps need to be ready for the next election round. So the next election rounds are primaries in May of 2022. So not that far away. And if you work your way backwards, is that our Pennsylvania Department of State is desperate. They're saying, we need the new maps. Don't do this to us. It takes, it takes a lot of work to get ballots squared away, to get everything, all the prep work done, to get elections ready for folks like us to go and vote. So the Department of State, which administers elections in our state, is saying, please, I need all of these maps, all three, new maps, approved and ready to roll by January 24th. That's not that far away. So where we are right now is that the, a lot of the, you heard a lot of conversation, a lot of news about the census data, the delays we have in, this, in the census data due to the pandemic. So the census data, the good news is the, I would say the Census Bureau has done a good job of delivering data. And we talk about easy data, don't worry about that. But what's happening right now is that the public has access to that same data Final set, and what we mean by easy data is it's kind of IT-ish in the sense that it's, it's in data formats that most people can work with. That's all that really means, as opposed to some, some very, very nasty data formats that very few people can really work with. So right now we are on the cusp of the end of the public cycle or the public segment for these committees. They've been holding committee meetings somewhat infrequently for the last two, three months. I've attended a few. There are not a whole lot going on, but they are, they are geared to provide input or get experts to come in and provide testimony to these commissions, either on the congressional side or on the state maps, and say, let's go, let's hear from it, because we've got a lot of work to do. But if you take a look at this data, just one other date that we at Fair Districts have kind of drawn a conclusion to, and is fundamental to why we're here tonight, is we think that all public input to these commissions needs to be submitted by October 13th. That's about a month away. I'm here tonight, and Justin is here tonight from Joel Damas to ask you guys one thing. Much of this you'll forget, no doubt. But Olivia has the PowerPoints and is happy to share it with everybody here. And the idea is that we want you to think about this. You're all voting age citizens of Pennsylvania. This is, we want this to be your problem as much as it is anyone else in the state, voting age citizens who think this is a problem as well. It's not cool to be part of a state that's often labeled and has been labeled accurately as a gerrymandered state. That means that politicians, political leaders are playing with us. They're manipulating us or ignoring us in many cases, so they can continue to do their thing. Obviously, that's wrong. It dilutes the reason we've had elections and voting and legitimate uh, contenders as well as candidates or even existing representatives and senators who have the right intentions, who want to do the right things, who want to get things done. But for, but for all the bad reasons, these maps come down and they, they drive away that kind of competitiveness. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what can you do. The process, again, I just want to remind you, this is a closed door process run by a cup by five to seven people. That's it. Has a direct impact on 13 million Pennsylvania citizens. We fought very hard for a number of for five, four years in Harrisburg to remove this process from the politicians and to give it to an independent citizens commissions. The most recent examples for, uh, would be Michigan in 2018 has moved from politicians drawing maps to citizens of voting in who could draw the maps as well. Well, that didn't happen for us in Pennsylvania. We won't be giving up, but in the meantime, we've got to deal with the reality of the small circle of friends, political leaders in Harrisburg, working largely behind the scenes to draw these maps. We hope by early October, I'm sorry, early November, that preliminary maps for House and Senate, these guys over here, will come out. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. Drawing 50 maps in Pennsylvania 
Uh, a little bit tough. It's a little bit tough. For example, a state senator has to represent about 260,000 citizens. A state rep, that number's going up. It's, we think about 64, 65,000. Joe, that's enough phone calls or emails to take in one day, right? So that's, that's a big number any way you cut it. There's a lot of people to you know, effectively represent. And congressional, the people we sent to Washington, right now that number's hovered around three quarters of a million. That number may, will go up. We've got more people in the US from 10 years ago to today, so that number's going up. So effective representation with those numbers is a real challenge. But when you couple that with maps that are set up to bypass that real urgent need for equitable representation, we've got real problems with our political systems in this country. So, so keep that in mind. I want you to start thinking about testimony. And, and this is my last slide. We'll talk about it. But this is what the criteria. This is what Fair Districts is looking for. And that's the last slide. But what we're looking for, follow the Pennsylvania Constitution. We're particularly focused on the LRC, the Legislative Reinforcement Commission, drawing our 253 maps. This is a Harrisburg problem. Redistricting and gerrymandering is a Harrisburg problem. It is not a Washington problem. It has to be solved in Harrisburg. So just keep that in mind. All right? So do we follow the Pennsylvania Constitution? Is there a max number of majority minority districts? Not too far from here. Couple of, we're not that far, but a, but a million miles away, the other side of the universe, is Pottstown. Pottstown, brown, largely poor, underrepresented. Carved in two at the state rec level, just school districts split in two. They're ready. Same thing. Carved up, district, you know, election wise. When you look at how the congressional maps work, same thing. We have a number of examples in Pennsylvania where there's no reason not to have a maximum number of what we believe should be majority minority districts. It can be done. And some of our map exercises that we've gone through said that's certainly doable. Some of the other criteria we're looking for right now, I showed those numbers. Follow those basic population gauges. There's a big number, 800,000 now for a, a, a congressperson in Washington. There are big numbers here. It's interesting that Montgomery County, if we look at the census data, I think our numbers are going to come up above 800, 830,000, something I believe is the numbers I've seen. So you could make the case that Montgomery County should have something similar to what this is at the congressional level, which is a nearly complete county with one dedicated congressperson. Just think if you were the county commissioner, the maps that came down in 2011 had five ports, parts of five different congresspeople's district in it. Five different congresspeople allegedly were representing parts of Montgomery County. Not one of those five congresspeople lived in Montgomery County. That's how badly Montgomery County or other candidate purple areas could get carved up. Can't let that happen. So that's a big deal. So was it split more than necessary? So we're really keeping an eye on the crazy splits that go down. Again, go no further than, is anyone here from Upper Dublin Township? It's okay. But Upper Dublin is a population of 27,000 good citizens. It got caught and it's very purpley based on registration voting patterns from 10 years ago. It got cut into three different state reps. Three different state reps. One school district had three different state reps. Carved up strategically to make sure that party A benefited from the next election cycles, the next four election cycles. It's nonsense, it's obvious, we know what they're trying to do, and it has to stop. Other criteria we look at here. What's my local voting precincts? This is really a bad thing. Precincts, that's your neighborhoods, if you will, or collect small collection of neighborhoods. Precinct splitting is nutsy as well. But again, you have to keep in mind that the map makers have used voting pattern data. It's accessible to draw maps. You can look at, you're not looking necessarily at your vote in the most recent election. They can look at your neighborhood, your community, and take a look at how is this trending, 
where's it going, et cetera. Let's, let's make sure that we've got our basis covered here when we draw things. And again, when you take a look at the gerrymandering, again, I'm happy to leave this here, there's really only two primary ways for, for gerrymandering. One is packing the district, one party, typically a minority party, if you will, the, the minority party in, in, the, in Harrisburg will pack as many of that party into one district, leaving more room and more candidate districts for my party. So packing was done. Where I live in 2011, I lived in a packed congressional district where I said, hey, how did this happen? You know, with all kinds of folks, all kinds of Democrats coming in from Philadelphia. I said, well, I, I don't live in Philadelphia anymore. What am I doing with all these nice people from Philadelphia? But it was a zigzag congressional district that packed in. It became an 80, I'm sorry, it was an 85% Democratic district. For that candidate who runs there, life is good. I'm going to win every time. But it left a lot more room to nitpick and, and, and find plenty of space for the other party to glean candidates and, 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 and get votes. And the other one, as I mentioned, is cracking. Cracking or splitting, if you will, districts to dilute the power of a particular voting block, uh, to carve them up. Pottstown, I used an example at the, at the state rep level, Pottstown, got tossed in in the last election, in the last uh, 2011 maps for the state rep, got tossed into rural Chester County. It wasn't quite, you know, it wasn't quite the same mix, so they became kind of a permanent minority in a very comfortable one-party district here. So these are things that become pretty obvious after a while. Natural geographic boundaries, we, got, we have rivers in our area. In Pennsylvania, we have a lot of mountains that create issues, but we keep an eye on those as well. And lastly, then, take a look at it. We, don't, we have to be careful with the phrase communities of interest because anybody can belong to any kind of communities of interest. These are the ones that we focus on. And say these are legit, typically, some kind of social or economic community of interest. School districts, it's very hard. Uh, we have, I believe the count is eight school districts in Montgomery County alone represented by two or more state reps. Takes a lot of work to do that. A one industry town in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of coal towns or steel towns or one industry towns of some kind. They need, represent, they need the best kind of representation possible. There are examples there, and we have examples where they were cut, carved in two to dilute their representation. And then lastly, you take a look at any kind of minority in which the second language uh, districts as well. So these are the kind of things we're going to be looking for when the maps come down. And what I need you to do, this is the last slide. This is all on our Fair Districts PA website here, and I think Olivia and friends can, can certainly provide that. But I've already submitted mine. Again, the, the, two, the parties that are going to be drawing the maps, they want to work in isolation. They don't want any feedback. They want to say, let's do our thing, get this thing done, get the desired result, and let's move on. The only way we counter that kind of basic thinking is to be heard and submit. We're, we're asking all of you to take a look at what we put out there. And it doesn't have to be much, it's just testimony, written testimony, not long, it's not, we're not asking for a thesis of any kind, we're looking for something that will be read. What gets read? What gets read is short. It doesn't have to be a dialogue, it's going to say diatribe, but it doesn't have to be that. But a short, passionate composition by you, directed at our leaders drawing these maps right now, to explain, make it brief, make it personal. Why is this important? Are you embarrassed to live in a, in a, in a state like Pennsylvania that regularly gets listed as one of the top five gerrymandered states in the country? Will we let it happen again? What kind of state is this? Why aren't we doing more to draw? Why is our population flattening out? We're thankful for all of you young people here, but why are large parts of the state emptying out? Where is that new investment? Where is that new reason for people to move here? for people to stay here. That's the kind of things. So make it specific, prioritize, but make it personal. That's all we're asking. But make it timely and make it because, like I said, we only have to about October 13th. So the Fair Districts website, Fair Districts PA, nothing to it, has a nice little section there that has an outline for you to create your composition. Your statement could be very short, not too long, for instance, and direct it to these folks and say why you will not tolerate any kind of gerrymandered solutions again. That's it for me. Thank you.
my name is Justin Villery. Uh, I am with Drought Alliance PA. Uh, we are a project of the Committee of 70. Um, I am going to so just give you a really good background on the uh, scene that we're dealing with and kind of the basics of redistricting. And now if I can find the HDMI hookup. Where did you use there that right there. I am going to show you the fun stuff. I think the fun stuff. If you're a huge mapping nerd like I am, you'll really enjoy this. And so, um, if you've got a computer out, I see a bunch of computers. Feel free to open them up, get them ready, and hopefully this uh, comes through. And we're going to take a look at, uh, I'm going to break this into a couple parts. The first is just a demo of how this mapping stuff works. So Rich talked about how uh, they can use very intricate sets of data uh, to carve up these communities. And so we're going to take a look at publicly available uh, mapping software that you can use just on the internet. Uh, to simulate the mapping process, and this is how you can inform yourself for the testimony that you're going to submit. These uh, commissions and committees in the General Assembly are also accepting your own map submissions, and that's what our project has been about for the last three plus years. We've been doing competitions for high schoolers, college students, adults to create their own maps and then submit them uh, to our competition for uh, judging, and then what we're doing is we have created this, all of these different maps that we received, we created the citizens map up here, which we think represents uh, a starting point for the General Assembly as they draw the congressional map. So we're just talking about uh, the old 18 district, we're losing a seat, it's gonna be 17 districts next uh, uh, for the next 10 years. So that's what we've done. But um, before we get too into that, I wanna show the actual mapping platform. So we are going to go to the wonderfully titled Dave's Redistricting Map, and it's just, you can see the um, uh, URL up there, it's just davesredistricting.org. This was created by, uh, his name is Dave Bradley, a uh, former Microsoft software engineer uh, in Seattle. Uh, and he just had a passion for this. And so we created uh, this mapping platform, GIS software, that allows people to draw their own maps. So you can see, how many of you are from Pennsylvania? And not from Pennsylvania? Awesome, cool. So. If you're Pennsylvanian, you can draw Pennsylvania. If you are registered to vote in Pennsylvania, I would highly recommend drawing Pennsylvania, even if you're not from here. If you are a registered voter, that's where your vote matters, where your voice matters. Uh, if you're registered somewhere else, um, then draw that map. Uh, but uh, tonight we're gonna be focused on Pennsylvania. So, uh, daysredistricting.org, uh, you can go into, uh, we're gonna click on Pennsylvania just to see uh, what the current maps look like. So we can see the congressional map here, the state senate map, state house map. So let's just do, we have Representative Webster here today. So let's go into the state house map. It might take a second to load because there's 203 seats. <laughs> no pressure, right? Um, there are 203 seats on this map that uh, we will see all the data that comes out. If you guys are hitting this too, it's going to, um, although it's a national website, it shouldn't be that slow. But uh, um, is anybody's working quicker than mine? Mine might be my internet. You guys seen it? I could jump on my hotspot. Because this will be important if you don't have fast internet. Uh, and for the record, that's, that's District 150. Let's go to this. Let's try this. Uh, so, what you're going to see is you're going to see a map of Pennsylvania, and then you're going to see all the districts over here. So, we saw from the old census, there were, this is uh, right on what Richard was talking about, about 63,000 people uh, in each district, plus or minus, you know, a few percent. Um, the, let me refresh this. This is going to be a quick demo if we can't get internet going. But ultimately, what we want to do is, if you're interested, you can draw your own maps and then submit those to uh, the Legislative Reapportionment Commission. Their um, websites are up here as well. And I'll make sure Olivia has these um, uh, so people can uh, use them. Oh, come on. Do you have your own personal hotspot? Yeah, this is mine. Is yours running any faster? Yeah, mine's awesome. Yours is. is it awesome? Yeah, oh, there mine's we go. Here we go. Okay. Sometimes it does take a little bit of time. All right, so now we're up and loading. So you can see from 
Uh, this was, these are the maps that were drawn in 2011 after the 2010 census. So if we just hover over each of these districts, you can kind of see, um, uh, it, let's, uh, let's focus on um, the district numbers here on the left side. So district one, actually let's go with, find our district here. Let's go to 150 uh, and then we're going to zoom in. I'm going to put my county lines in. So you can see all the different, I think this is here, here's where we are. All right. So here's Representative Webster's district. You can see on the left side here, population details. So this is the total number of people that were in the district as of census day in 2010. All right, you can see the racial breakdown. You can also see, this is the data that's available to politicians, but they have a lot better data because they pay a lot of money for it. So they can see, um, or what we can see, is just general election information. So you can see that over the last four elections, this is congressional, um, governor's races, uh, U.S. Senate races, U.S. House races, um, that generally the average Democratic vote is 52.6%, Republican vote 46%. So, like Rich said, this is a pretty purple district. So, we could go a little further down. We could click, this is District 148, if we go a little further down into Montgomery County. Now we're starting to see, if you can see this, it's kind of small, it says 66% Democratic in District 148, just in southern Montgomery County. We go into Philly, let's go into Center City. This is District 181. You can see, click on that. This is 94% Democrat. So it's a lot easier to see this. Uh, let me see, there we go. All right, so you can kind of see uh, the uh, composite election results from um, the last uh, four uh, election cycles. So, um, this is the type of data that is publicly available here, but the parties have this, and it's much more powerful. So they can literally decide how they want to uh, divide their voters up just based off of the, the blocks that we, um, that they're showing here. Uh, uh, but also not just uh, election results, the type of shows you watch, the pages on Facebook that you like, uh, people on Instagram that you follow. Uh, all that stuff goes into um, very complicated algorithms that they can then use to predict your voting power. So, what Draw the Lines is about and what this uh, wonderfully um, titled uh, uh, mapping software, the redistricting app, uh, is about is trying to give that power back to uh, the people who can take uh, these tools and create their own maps. So, we are going to look at, very quickly, uh, how to draw your own map. So we're going to go, let's go back to the home page here, and then click on maps and new map up here. So this is all, um, these are all the maps that I've drawn. Uh, again, I'm a huge mapping nerd. Um, but we're going to go to our sinus demo. And you're welcome to follow along as you do this, either on the live stream or here if you have a computer. We're going to create Pennsylvania. Let's use... Uh, we're going to use the 2020 precinct, precinct uh, shapes. Those are all the small little brown lines that we saw um, uh, on the map previously. We're going to draw, let's draw just Congress for now. So um, we're going to do the entire state, 17 districts. That's how many Pennsylvania is going to have. You're going to see there's about 764,000 people that we have to try to get into every district. So we've got our election data if we want it. And then we're going to create the map here. So. Slowly. How come there's all this momentum like that? Uh, a little <laughs> slow down on the website. Is anybody else trying this on their computer? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So I like data redistricting. There's another one that's called District Builder. So let's see if District Builder is working any faster. Doesn't look like it. There we go. All right. So this, I'm back to Dave's now.
Okay, so let's let's get organized here. So I like to have the county lines up. That helps me orient, and then I'm gonna put the labels on too, so I know which counties I'm dealing with. I'm gonna take the precinct lines off for now. So let's just look at counties. All right. So what you can do is generally the numbers on Pennsylvania's congressional districts start southeast and then move west. So we're going to select District 1. This is how you select your district up here. 2, 3, 4. So I'm going to go to District 1. That's traditionally been, is anybody here from Bucks County? All right. So you have, if you've been around since the 1930s, you've lived in either District 1 or a district that is fully contained within Bucks County. Bucks County has rarely ever been split up in Pennsylvania's history. So we're going to try to keep them together. Let's put, we're going to select county as our mapping block. And so what you're doing is you're just selecting individual counties, or if we zoom uh, further, you can select cities or precincts, and you're going to put Bucks County into District 1. So you can see there, now we see our district details here. Bucks County, we have about 646,000 people that are in uh, Bucks County, so now that's who is in District 1. You can see the racial breakdown, it's a fairly white county. You can see the voting age population uh, um, uh, demographics, and then you can also see the uh, election results. So it's a pretty purple county from a competitive standpoint. But we're still missing about 118,000 people. And in congressional districts, you need to have almost exactly the same number of people for your districts. You can't, it's the concept of one person, one vote, which is a Supreme Court case decided in the 60s. Uh, districts used to have wide, wide ranges uh, of difference in um, population in districts. You could have one rural uh, district that had 10,000 people and an urban district that had 500,000 people, and they would each have one representative, which is very unfair to the people who live in a much larger district, right? Their votes were way, uh, way fewer. So uh, um, the change is that now every district has to have the same number of people in it. So we still need 118,000 people to go into bucks. So let's go, oops, let me, so that's a mistake. You can use your undo button there. Let me click onto the pan button here and move over. So we either need to go up into the Lehigh Valley, over into Montgomery County, or down into Philadelphia. All right, I'm going to pick up my Bucks resident. If you had to add 100,000 people, what community do you think would fit best with Bucks County as far as how it wants to be represented? Is there uh, similar cultures or um, industry uh, or towns that have, and this is just your opinion, there's no one <laughs> right or wrong answer. Um, if you were drawing the map, would you go up in the, in the Lehigh Valley? Would you go into Philly? Would you go over to Montgomery County? Or maybe some of all three? Um, I am biased because I live closest to Montgomery County, but I think either Montgomery County or Lehigh Valley would be the best choice. I think Philly is too um, rural. Yeah. And Montgomery County is too rural. Yeah. Um, but Philly is Gotcha. All right. So you're going. Perfectly valid. This is a great uh, um, uh, conversation about trade-offs and different values that happen when you're trying to draw a map. So you're, from what I'm hearing, it would be good to maintain Bucks County's competitive uh, spirit. So you want to have um, more, uh, um, and so if you go into Philly, you might have too many Democratic votes that would overwhelm Bucks County uh, and make it not competitive, if that's, if that's a value. So perfectly uh, uh, um, Perfectly fine. So let's, we can't make all of Lehigh or Northampton County. Oops, let me zoom back out here. I've got, I'm going to zoom this. I'm not used to using a trackpad, guys. I'm use a mouse. And to Justin's point, if you take a look at this map here, that's exactly what happened. There's beautiful blue Montgomery County, if you will, that was kept in town, single representative, but they encroached into Montgomery County. Now, if you're a Montgomery County commissioner or a county commissioner of any kind, here we go again, right? Multiple reps to people who live not too far from here, that say Horsham Township, Montgomery, Montgomery Mall, Montgomery Township not too far from here, got pulled into a Bucks County congressional district. And when I made the rounds there, various events or so like that, they're yelling at me. I said, I, 
I didn't do anything. This is what happens when people get, and most folks do, get pretty parochial about once they find out what kind of districts they're being and who's representing them, who else is in my district. So this is a perfect example where you see the, we, ran, we didn't have enough population in Bucks County, so in 2018, the map makers went to Montgomery County to pick up the balance. All right, all right, thank you, Rich, for riffing there. So I'm going to put my precinct lines back on because we don't, we can't have all of Lehigh County. So if I were to click on Lehigh County here, you would see on the right side those county details in this very far um, uh, toolbar over here. There's over 375,000 people in Lehigh County. There's 312,000 people in Northampton County. So we only need 118,000. So we're going to go into the precinct level. And this is where you can start uh, um, getting down into your closer population deviation. So I'm going to go into Lehigh County, and I'm going to just click and hold and move all of these into the first congressional district. And we can see now we're down to 68,000. We need a few more. So we're starting. We're just kind of like blindly grabbing uh, different uh, precincts here regardless of municipality. So we're just trying to get close to that number. All right, so we're close. So let's see how we did. Now we're still, we're still competitive, 51.6 Democratic. But we can also look at some of the other um, uh, uh, items that we've created here. So we have, uh, it's, I clicked on the statistics button, and you can see uh, it's uh, still pretty white, 81,000 people, oh, now 83,000 people just updated. Uh, and you can see, uh, um, we have to go into this analyze feature here, but there's other um, scores that we're looking at. So we're looking at competitiveness, um, but we're also looking at compactness. Compactness is the idea that you don't want to have districts. You can see some of them that are sprawling all over the place uh, that are really not compact at all. And so this, uh, this map, um, uh, that district at least, is fairly compact. These are compactness scores, which we don't have time to go into tonight. But um, those are pretty competitive. Those are pretty strong compactness scores. Um, we're also uh, um, uh, not splitting too many counties with this map, obviously, because we've got, oh, it didn't uh, save my, my move. Oh, well. Um, uh, we're not you know, sprawling into Montgomery County as well. We're only sprawling into Lehigh and Northampton. Um, but we're not sprawling into Philly either. So. Um, this is you know, just the very basics of how to draw your own map. And we would invite everyone to do that uh, uh, on your own. So the second part of what I wanted to do here um, was uh, take a look uh, at some additional districts. Maybe if anybody has, uh, from where you're from, um, want to take a look at your, uh, your district, uh, whether it's congressional, state house, state senate, um, we can uh, analyze it, see if it uh, makes sense to you. Um, yes, yeah, volunteer. PA06. PA06. So you're talking congressional? Yeah. Sounds like. Worcester County. All right. Let's go back to Dave's here. All right. So your representative is then Madeline Dean. Is that right? Your congresswoman? Uh, Chrissy Houlihan. Chrissy Houlihan's the sixth. Dean is the fifth. No. Fourth. Dean's the fourth, right? Okay. So Houlihan. All right. So we're going to go pull up the. Um, Congressional map slowly. Do you know the congressional map off the top of your head, like what it looks like? And, uh, any thoughts? No? Right. no. Okay, here we go. If you did, I would be impressed. I know it got changed a lot in 2018. Right. Mm -hmm. So this used to be. You used to live close, maybe in this district here. Does this look familiar? <laughs> This is, this is called the Goofy Kicking Donald Duck District. So this went through five counties, I believe. So it improved uh, significantly from where it was. And this was the result of single party control in Harrisburg drawing the districts for one goal, and that was to maximize their power. So while we don't want the courts involved in this too much, sometimes the courts are necessary to ensure that that doesn't happen. All right, so let's look at the sixth. So the sixth is this green district here, right? So you said you're in Chester County? Yeah. Right. So what do you think of this district? Do you think it makes sense to go up and uh, catch Redding? Would you 
like to see it. So Chester County has, how many people are in uh, Chester? Uh, 534,000. So it has to add some people. Do you think it makes sense to go up into Berks and catch Redding? Would it make more sense to go into Delaware County, Montgomery County, Lancaster County? I think Montgomery and Chester are pretty similar in a lot of ways. Okay. I live in Queensville, which is very similar to Collegeville. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Going from one county to the next. Right, right. But the people, but the people who live in the southwestern part of Chester County would be able to live to that because they have a lot more in common with the folks from Lancaster County. Mm -hmm. That's how that works. Huh? Yeah, that's me. So, like, I'm from, like, right on the border of Chester and Lancaster. So, like, right. I actually live in Chester and work in Lancaster. Oh, Lancaster over here. So. Yeah, so, like, especially for me, we're, like, a very rural, underfunded area that definitely mm -hmm. is more in common with Lancaster. So, you would probably want to branch out. Mm -hmm. Definitely not ready. That's, not ready. That's where I would, that, that would be my takeaway. Gotcha. Not ready. <laughs> All right. It's interesting, Reading is kind of at this nexus of three very different regions in Pennsylvania, right? You've got the southeast, and you've got the northeast, and then you've got south central. And so as you're drawing maps, the biggest lesson if you start to draw your own map is that you're going to experience a lot of tough choices and trade-offs that you have to make. There is no such thing as a perfect map. And you two, right here, exhibited this perfectly. You guys have a small disagreement about where to add population for Chester. And you can't just say, well, let's add them both. Let's put Lancaster County in and let's also put Montgomery County in. Because then you start to run up to population requirements. You start to run into compactness problems. Remember, Rich talked about uh, minimizing county and municipal splits. You start to have too many splits, too. There's a lot of different challenges that go into play here. And what we are saying, and then fair districts, fair districts would say this as well, is those conversations have to be had out in the open. You have to have... Uh, people, not just politicians, but people talking about how they want to be represented, how they want the maps to look. Yeah, well, you're, and again, if, if you're planning to submit testimony, one of the key questions, I think there's three. One is, what is your criteria? What are your primary criteria for drawing a map to say, okay, this is what we're going to follow more than anything else? You then want to supplement those questions, the other two questions were, well, who's drawing your maps for you? So it's, it's professional map drawers that are drawing it. And then, most importantly as well, what they are they doing? How deep are they going into personal voting to draw maps? So, with that criteria, what are the critical rules that you're following here to drive how your final maps are drawn? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? How about, let's look at the old PA. So this is not just Cooper and Donald, but everything. It's a good match here. Is anybody from out in Western PA? Westmoreland County, Allegheny County, Cambria County? No? All right. So if you were, they have their own version of Goofy Picking Battle. And that was the malnourished hammerhead shark right here. If I <laughs> scroll down. This was, that was the Post-Gazette, what they called this district. <clears throat> so there's reasons for every one of these lines. Some of them make perfect sense, trying to keep the municipality together. Pittsburgh is a very weird shape. If you're trying to keep Pittsburgh together, Pittsburgh has a lot of weird carve-outs, and most of them are geographic, but some of them aren't. But this is not a natural shape right there. That was done, from what I understand, to make to grab some extra Democratic votes and pull them into the city of Pittsburgh, and then it kind of it takes Beaver County and circumvents around most of Alabama County, and then it goes all the way into like Cambria and Somerset County, the Hammerhead Shark. Right? And so that's the maximized partisan advantage. And then that creates spillover effects. There's all these trade-offs and um, chain reactions that happen where you start to get maybe, what is it, maybe a Pac-Man type district that is the go-around now. And so imagine how difficult this is for a congressperson to represent, regardless of what party you're from. You have to represent folks who live in this part of your district, but then also folks who live way over here down in that York County. And so it's... Uh, the, I don't know who that representative was, um, but I imagine they had a huge challenge representing people in, if this is Washington County and New York County, those are very, very different parts of Pennsylvania, right? So it creates a challenge for the politicians as well. They um, are probably safe um, from uh, defeat in elections, but I don't imagine their jobs are very easy from uh, constituent service standpoint. So. Any other districts up here that people recognize as what used to be theirs? These, again, this is the map that was overturned in 2018. So this map is no longer enforced, but it's kind of what we're trying to beat. 
because the politicians do this one, and now they're going to be drawing them again. Anybody recognize this black district as theirs? I call. Yes. Is that yours? Yeah. So where are you from? Um, Scranton. Scranton, yeah. So this was, again, if I recall, uh, uh, Rich talked about the uh, concept of cracking and packing. This was an attempt to pack a lot of blue voters again. It's Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, and then uh, catching um, uh, down east and now in town catching over to Pottsville, uh, and so it creates uh, a number of safe red districts around it while packing a number of uh, uh, blue voters into one single district. Your goal, if you're a gerrymanderer, is to try to win as many districts as possible by 5, 10, 15 percent, and then you want your opponents to win as few districts as possible, 85 to 15, 90 to 10, right, because they're wasting votes. So every vote beyond the, we're first past the post. Every vote beyond 50% is uh, a wasted vote if you're winning, or not getting 50% is a wasted vote if you're losing. That makes sense? Cool. So um, that's what created these uh, maps here. If you're a Republican, I've been um, harping on Republicans a little bit for their 2011 map, they have uh, strong concerns about the 2018 map because it was drawn by the courts. It was drawn by a, a professor from Stanford who uh, was not a Pennsylvanian who didn't have deep connections to this state. And so it's a perfectly legitimate concern that the court would be drawing or requesting a, uh, a map that wasn't drawn by Pennsylvania citizens in an open process as well. So uh, what we're hoping to change is that that process can be more open this time around. And again, that's where you guys come in. So I think the last part, and then we can open up questions, uh, is showing you exactly what Rich was talking about, how you all can submit testimony. So we've got on the website here, Rich talked about two things. There's the congressional maps. We are looking at, it's paredistricting.com. Uh, you can see uh, um, they've got a schedule here. It's run by the PA House Republican Caucus. That's simply because they are in the majority. And so they, um, uh, just the mechanics of how um, uh, governmental operations work in Harrisburg, they put out the website. So it doesn't mean that you're just submitting it to uh, House Republicans. Um, you should, hopefully, be everybody you seeing, right? Um, but uh, you would go into your provide input here, and then you can create your own map. You can comment on the current map, uh, and, and here's where they have the ability to up, uh, soon we'll, uh, upload uh, your own statewide map. If you want to actually submit uh, or um, uh, attend a hearing, uh, this is their hearing schedule. We are going to be having our hearings local. Uh, in October, around October 19th. So uh, feel free if you're really fired up about this and want to go testify in person, uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, Rich, I'm noticing did they cancel one of the hearings? No, they didn't. There's five. Okay, never mind. Um, and then on the LRC side, they have a separate website. So this is for the state House maps, state Senate maps. We just looked at congressional, now we're talking about the state, uh, state House. They have a separate website. Um, and you can do the same thing. You can provide uh, your information here through this comment button. Again, you can submit written testimony. You can upload your own map. So, you good. Any other questions? I, I mean, we can open this now. Is that a good time to do that? Yeah. Are there any questions for Rich or myself, or any comments or um, general thoughts? Yes. Um, I know we said that it would be beneficial to keep the courts out of the redistricting process. Is there a specific reason as to why like, we would like to do that? It's mostly a concern from, uh, and this is my opinion, you can jump in this as well. Um, uh, the Republican argument that they've used with 2018 is that the courts shouldn't have gotten involved. And so if you're trying to create a bipartisan consensus, they're especially, uh, with both, part, both processes, on the congressional side, like Rich said, you have to have a map that's done by Republican-controlled uh, General Assembly in the House and Senate and passed by a Demo or signed by a Democratic governor, just like any other bill. So that would be a bipartisan process where everybody could come together and agree on a map without court involvement. The Democrats have the ace in the hole on the congressional side because they own the state Supreme Court majority. And so, um, 
that's kind of their fallback plan. Um, if you're a Democrat, like a hardcore partisan Democrat, that might be what you want to do. If uh, um, you're a redistricting reformer, you would like to keep it out of the courts just because it becomes a partisan process. On the LRC side, um, the courts will possibly in be involved again. They've been involved in the past. Uh, but again, hopefully there's a consensus between the two Republicans, two Democrats, and then Chairman Nolenberg uh, before it gets to that point. So. Does that answer your question? It's a great question. Yeah. Joe, I just wanted to point out, do you think it's a good idea that districts are always in contention in the legal system? Mm -hmm. That there's always somebody challenging? I mean, to, to me, or to no. anybody, the, no. the, the tenuousness of who's my rep, where do I live, what's my district, is not a good thing. So. It, it is, by nature, a contentious process, mm -hmm. but using the criteria, and I was one of those people, you know, running for office on the fair districts, redistricting matters. Mm -hmm. So I'm certainly supportive of what you've heard tonight. Um, you want your districts to be competitive so that you get decision makers in Harrisburg who are willing to look at all sides of an issue and actually try to solve a problem, whether it's, you know, roads and bridges, right? Pennsylvania's 48th in the country and gets a B minus on infrastructure because we can't agree on anything. So you want people in Harrisburg who have to actually solve problems. Unfortunately, we do believe there'll be some litigation. Yeah, there, there always is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the hope is that the more citizen input there is, the more blunted that litigation would be. And I did want to say from a testimony standpoint, to date, um, the LRC, the uh, commission that's drawing the state maps, has been more open and inviting for public testimony. The chairman, foolishly or not, has said uh, that he promises to read every submitted <laughs> comment. Now, how do we measure that? I don't know, but that's what he said. So there's an opening there. Okay, so you have the opportunity. Our experience today, based on the feedback that we're getting, is that he is reading at least some of it. So, so please do. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so what exactly is Governor Wolf's role with redistricting? Like how does his veto power impact? Is there, is there a redraw after a veto, or is that... Like it's, only, it's only for the congressional. He has no say. The governor has no say on the 253 state maps. He's out. So it's legislation. It comes in eventually. He goes, I like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. We veto it. Back it goes. Around and round and round we go. Again, it's a political legislative process. So if that doesn't happen before an election, is that is there going no, to be? It happens once every ten years. It's, it's a good question because there true. is actually a lawsuit before the state supreme court right now that's kind of on hold that the Democratic National Committee has filed uh, to state that if there is not an agreement, then they are requesting that the court take control of the process essentially by a certain time, which would likely be before that January 24th date that uh, flashed up, but to Rich's point. It's a very supposed to, schedule that we're on right now. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? So like, if you were to take an area like Philadelphia, which is primarily Democrat, to make that, like, you're keeping it compact, but then it's not, like, competitive. So would you sacrifice the compactness to go in maybe a more Republican area to draw that district, or do you leave it as it is? You probably won't be able to make Philadelphia Democratic unless you draw, and I could show you some competition entries that we had of people who really tried to make every district competitive, and they start snaking Philadelphia out into the burbs, and you get these right. very long districts, which everybody would probably hate, right? Because you're, you're uh, ignoring uh, two of the primary goals that are written in the state constitution and which the congressional maps have been judged on as well, and that's compactness and county splits. So it's a great question, and it's a, a concept of trade. Yeah, and I think the I think the answer is competitive is a good measure where practical or where possible. It just isn't in large parts of the state. Um, you know, if you just drive across the northern half of the state, it's Republican. It just it has been for forever. So you're not going to just you can't create competitiveness where it isn't practical. So where it can, and again, Montgomery County, or a little bit more Montgomery County. Chester Bucks, um, 
it's more pro it's more possible in, in certain areas. Well, I, would, I would argue or suggest that you want the districts to actually actually be represented. Right. So in Philadelphia, probably it should be a Democratic representative, and, and in another county, it should be competitive, mm -hmm. and in the Northwest, it should be a Republican. Mm -hmm. Example of the testimony I, I attended a Senate state government committee hearing in Temple a couple of weeks ago, and there was very passionate testimony. There was two gentlemen representing Latino communities of uh, Philadelphia who were absolutely passionate that we must be together. They had examples of some state representation where they got carved up back in 2011, and all of a sudden they got, again, cracked, if you will, but dispersed into into other districts where they became a kind of a fixed minority. So there are folks who, this is what they're looking for. And the arguments, frankly, have a lot of sense. They just didn't. I was going to show you guys. We have an exercise on our website called Flashes of Insight, which looks at all the different values that uh, have to be considered and traded off uh, as you're drawing your map. So we don't have time to put this my internet right now. So. Any other questions? Comments? Anybody going to go home and try to draw their own map? Yeah. All right, good, good. Thank you for saving me a little bit of embarrassment. <laughs> Justin, do you think starting with the congressional is easier? Yes, starting with congressional is 17 piece puzzle instead of 16 or 203. One last question. Okay. We have one more question down here. Well, and then we'll let you go. Well, I'm just curious about the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Why is it important for college students like us to focus on this issue specifically? Why is it important for college students to be looking into this? It's so useful. Well, let's let the audience answer that. Besides getting out of the biology test, <laughs> why did you come? Why did everyone show up to this? What did you want to learn? Did we achieve that? Because one of the things we're trying to instill is some sense of urgency, some sense of engagement in the political process. Like I said, particularly in Harrisburg, they work in darkness and thriving. So it's OK. We'll just move on. Why do you think this was important? It's okay, there's no right answer for this. Go ahead. I mean, I'm from Connecticut, so... Not a please. Oh, I'm from Connecticut, so I feel like it's important for me to understand what's going on here, because this is going to be important. So this is important. I mean, I'm from Maryland, and as you mentioned in the beginning, we have very bad issues with gerrymandering. And it kind of affects our daily lives there, not just how we vote and who represents us, but what gets done, our infrastructure, things that happen, it's more than just, I'm interested in politics and this is what interests me, it's more this is how I live, this is my community, this is what's happening to it. Also. I've lived in Pennsylvania all my life and I have a pretty limited understanding of Pennsylvania politics. Um, you know, I'm starting to develop a little more of that. I, I take a lot of politics courses, I'm getting a good macro understanding of how the U.S. system works, but so Olivia's question, my answer to that question is because I didn't know anything or very little. I was fully immersed in work and family and all that. When I got involved, this is an amazing education. What happens in state capitals, what happens at the state level, on everyday life, the spending, if you will, the energy that goes into healthcare, that goes into education, that goes into infrastructure, you go down the laundry list. This stuff happens at state and local levels. This is where decisions are being made or not made. And like I said, when I, I've lived in Pennsylvania all my life, it just feels like we're stuck in the mud here a little bit. We are not a go-to destination for, you, for enough young people. We're getting a little sick of people moving to Texas or Florida or Carolinas you know, because they think there may be more happening there, more opportunity, whatever it may be. So we need to make the state a little more dynamic, more attractive. We're in competition with other states for a variety of reasons. And why are we comfortable sitting on a on an old model or old thinking? So I think that's a huge thing. And when things don't get done, and there's not a feel that Pennsylvania's on the move, it doesn't help. I mean, it's nice where, where we're at right now, Southeast PA, economically for a variety of fronts, we're doing well. I mean, we're doing well if you look at uh, 
a number of things, but when you look at the state in general, particularly outside of where we're living right now, it's not so good. It's not so good from an opportunity or an economic standpoint or a reason to stay. So that's why we need to change the culture we hope. And gerrymandering it cuts to the heart of a lot of this. Like I said, it's, it's, the, it's the quiet, silent, backdoor process, the closed door process that seals in a lot of bad things, or the potential for bad things. And it's real hard to undo, isn't it? So I'm trying to avoid all that. So I hope that answered your question. Be interested if our hostess here would uh, provide a, some insight. Uh, yeah, we have, we're the, we're the next, we're, we're up next, Gen Z, after the millennials. We're up next in leadership. We have so many problems we have to solve, right? So many things that are going to be thrusted upon us. So I just hope that you kind of take this in, into that mindset and bring that with you when you go into the next time you vote, which is the municipal um, elections coming up in November. It's a never-ending process, and you can't get away from politics as much as you want to. So make sure you stay on top of it and um, you stay you stay informed. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. And thank you for having me.